Yeah. Well, you guys, I want to welcome everybody uh, to our Bible study. Uh, as you know, we're on every Saturday morning. Let me turn on this Facebook thing here. We're on every Saturday morning, and um, not sure many of you uh, what your experience has been with the Bible study in the past. Sometimes they call things Bible studies that really shouldn't be called Bible studies, but this is a Bible study. And we go uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So we've gone through Genesis, we've gone through Exodus, we've gone through the Gospel of Mark. And now we're going through this short letter uh, that Jude wrote, and it's only 25 verses. But if you remember when we first began, uh, Jude uh, assumes that we are familiar with the Bible. So he says, I don't write to give you any news but I write to you to remind you, good morning, Gary. I write to you to remind you of the things that you really should have already known. So he's writing to an audience and he believes that that audience is familiar with the Bible. Uh, Jude could not have known that in these, or maybe he did, maybe because of his letter, we, we would assume that he did know that in these last days, so many, many, uh, Christians, children of God, would not be familiar with uh, with their Bible, be familiar with lots of other things, uh, lots of other books, lots of other philosophies. But in so many lives of so many Christians, it seems that the Bible comes last. And so that's why this ministry exists. And we're so glad that God has designed it in such a way where we can do it on Zoom and literally uh, share the Bible with people all around the world. And uh, it's not for nothing, as they say in New York. Jude also writes in the beginning of his verses that we would be able to contend for the faith. And you can't contend for the faith unless you know the word. And so Bible study is very important. And I think more so in these last days than maybe times past. Uh, because, again, so many people aren't familiar with uh, their Bible. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Roberta. So with that said, turn uh, to your Bibles, to uh, the book of Jude, Jude chapter one. There's only one chapter. We're going to pick it up in verse three. But as you're doing that, I'm going to pray and uh, I'm going to pray uh, in regards to God teaching us this morning, but also uh, for two people that are ill. One of them, his name is George. And uh, George is from, what is that little nation to the east of, um, what? oh, Belize. He's from Belize. And uh, they brought him over from Belize so that the doctors could help him here in the United States. And they uh, did some exploratory stuff the other day, and they found out that he has cancer all through his spine, which is very painful. So I would invite you guys to pray for George throughout the week. And we also want to pray for my daughter-in-law's grandmother, a very sweet lady. Uh, her name is South Sea, like the South Sea there in the uh, Pacific Islands. And, um, and she uh, fell down and hit her head uh, in the shower or the bathtub. And uh, they believe that the issue is uh, not that she slipped and fall, but something else going on with her that caused her to lose her balance. And so we're going to pray that God would speak to us and that God would touch these two individuals. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, our Father, not knowing everything, not knowing why you allow certain things, not knowing why you do certain things or the way that you do them or the time that you do them. But we pray to you, Lord, trusting that it'll all work together for the good of those who love you. And with that, Lord, we pray that you would increase our love for you more and more and more. That if we had anything of such importance in our life prior to today, that that thing would come in second next to you, Lord. That you would be first in our lives. And that our lives would implement that in every way, in every department. Because until we come to that place, until we come to that place of total intimacy with you, Jesus, we cannot understand your word. We can't understand things going on in the world. And we will begin to doubt and lose hope. And we will begin to doubt your promises, which are so precious to us and so true. And then, of course, Lord, we would give way 
to things like the apostates did. As we read this letter uh, written by Jude, and he describes the apostates, and we scratch our head and say, how could that have happened? And now we understand, Lord, as hindsight is 2020, as they say, we understand looking back how it was that they lost their faith and began to lead others down that same path. They began to doubt you. They began to think that they knew more than you did. They began to think that they could read the Bible and yet do life and do ministry their own way until finally they became people who had totally fallen away from you. And so, Lord, we would ask you to guard us from that, to teach us your word. Father, that your word would go into us, Lord, like that double-edged sword that is spoken of in the book of Hebrews, that cuts both ways, that cuts to the marrow, so that we can begin to think like you, so that we can begin to view the world like you, so that we can begin to be a witness to the world like you were, so that we can come to that point of total transformation from who we were to who you are. That our flesh would not be rehab, but that it would just go someplace and die, Lord, so that you can live in us and through us and have your way. So remember George and remember South Sea today and remember us, Lord, and we ask you to teach us now to remove me, to remove any of ideas that we have collectively of any other belief that would oppose your word, that would be different from your word, and fill us now with who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Peter. Okay, so um, we're going to pick it up. In uh, Jude, of course, chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, Jude said that he found it necessary to write uh, to us, says to you, but to us, exhorting you to contend, that is to fight for, earnestly, for the faith, right? And so I can tell you, of course, that the best way to, and many of you guys already know this, that the best way, good morning, David, to, uh, to fight for and defend your faith is to know what you believe and to know why you believe it. And you will be surprised when you challenge some Christians and you say, you know, you, you know hymns. And, and I see you very passionate and excited in church. And when you talk about Jesus and who rah, rah, can you tell me what you believe and why you believe it? You will be shocked at how many uneducated Christians there actually are, and it's not their fault. It's the fault of their leaders, their pastors, for not teaching the full counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. I say that over and over and over again, and I'm convinced now I'm not going to change their mind. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. But uh, to our small audience, we're going to be faithful in doing that because God gave us the whole Bible to teach the whole Bible to grow in the way of the whole Bible. And so we're never going to compromise that, not in this ministry. And so when we talk about the full counsel of God, we're talking about the Old Testament and we're talking about the New Testament. And it's very sad. I don't know if this has happened to you or not. It's happened to me. It's very sad when, good morning, Christian. I'm glad you're with us. When the Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or, or Muslims or Buddhists or the New Age people or people in 12-step programs, they'll tell you about their philosophy and their literature. They'll tell you about the history of it, uh, what the message is, what their purpose. And they know so much about all that they are preaching or teaching or sharing with you. And so many Christians know so little about their Bible. It is very, very, it's more than sad. It's alarming. It's shocking, actually. And there's a lot of Christians involved in a lot of things, but very few things, if any, have to do with the teaching of Genesis to Revelation. The focus is on marriage. That's good. The focus is on witnessing. That's good. The focus is on worshiping. Good morning, Frank. That's good. All of those things are uh, very good, no doubt about it. But the core, the foundation of all those things is the word of God. And so... You know, when the uh, apostates, these ungodly people, Jude says, with false doctrine, when they come into the church or they come to your home or to your children or something, they are noticed. They are noticed. They, sh they should stand out like a big red flag. 
you know, in years past, they don't come anymore, <clears throat> but the Mormons used to come to our house. And first there was two, and then there were four. And then the last time they came, they were six, and they brought with them a Muslim missionary from, from Africa. And um, the reason they kept coming back and coming back with so many is because I attend a church that teaches the Bible, and I knew the Bible, and I was able to challenge their doctrine against the Bible. And they had no defense until they don't come to our house anymore. True story. When the Mormons canvass a neighborhood, okay, they begin to mark certain addresses with notes. And eventually, they will mark your address in a way where nobody from the Mormon church, I'll call it a church, is to uh, visit your house anymore because they don't want you to convert their missionaries to your Christian faith. That's right. You say, well, Mario, I thought the Mormons were Christians. If you're saying that, it's because you're not familiar enough with the Bible to know that their Book of Mormon is very, very different. Same thing with the Jehovah's Witness. Those guys are military style. I mean, they study their Bible, the New World Translation, okay, a false Bible. They study it back and forth and sideways, up and down, at least once a week. They would put most Christians to shame by the way that they know their, uh, their Bible. So if you don't know the Bible, when these people come in, they will come in unnoticed. And then everybody in your life and around your life is going to be uh, effective. So I'm not, uh, you know, crashing uh, any uh, denomination that doesn't do that. Uh, Victory Outreach, we had a couple of Victory Outreach people over our house uh, last week. Um, there's the Foursquare, there's Assemblies of God, there's all of these recovery ministries, there's prison ministries, there's missionaries, there's all of these things. But I say, thank God for Calvary Chapel and churches and this ministry and other ministries like this that promise to be totally devoted to taking people through all of the scriptures because all of those ministries stand on a foundation that is the word of God. It's the word of God. And so thank God for those ministries that actually teach the Bible, that actually offer the foundation for what the rest of us believe and how we operate in the way of, uh, of ministry. Because look at verse 4 in Jude. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. Jude said that in his day, and this is prophetic because it's happening in our day, even more than it did in his day, he says certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. He says they are ungodly men. That's interesting because they appear to be godly in every sense of the word. He says ungodly men, and they turn the grace of our God into lewdness. That is a license to sin. Hey, you're on your journey. You're in your process. If you're destroying your children's lives or other people's lives, well, it's okay. You're in your process. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. But this is what they do. He says, and they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen. Shh. Never mention Jesus because you're going to offend people. And so they have their own strategy. The way we're going to win people to God is, first of all, we're never going to mention Jesus. Shh. Where do you find that in the Bible? Listen. If that's a strategy, that is their own strategy. That is not any kind of strategy that we find in the, in the church, in the real church of Jesus Christ. And so he says that these people, these men crept into the church unnoticed. And he tells us that they turned the grace of God into a license for sin. And they deny Jesus. That becomes very interesting. Those two subjects become very interesting if you do an in-depth study of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches. And Jesus will tell you exactly his thoughts on that. And then, of course, <clears throat> nobody even noticed. Why didn't they notice? Because too many in the church were not familiar enough with the Bible. That's why they didn't notice. And it doesn't take much. There's this whole philosophy about the work. Do the work and the work and do the work. 
You want me to tell you something? If Jesus made it that complicated, none of us would be saved. Or we would always doubt our salvation. Jesus makes it so much simpler than that. He says, listen, forget all the work. I did all the work. Just hang around with me. And I will love it, says Jesus. And you will love it because I'm going to satisfy your soul. You tried all these other things. Now let me, through my word, satisfy your soul. And if you do that, these creeps are not going to come in unnoticed. You will recognize them. I wanted to get into something in regards to the book of Revelation when John saw the vision and he saw that woman writing on the beast and in her hand were a couple of abominations. And when John saw her, he was shocked. You know why? He recognized her. Why did he recognize her? Because he saw that the church in the future had become the false church. That's why he recognized. That's why he was so shocked. One day we're going to get into the book of Revelation. And uh, man, we're going to be blown away. And we're going to get into it a lot when we do the footsteps of Paul. That's why we're visiting those seven churches. So if you haven't signed on for that, please, please come with us. So because of that, Jude gives us one of the greatest Bible studies in just 25 verses. And if you break it down, we did in the beginning, kind of broke it up into a, an outline First, he gives us seven illustrations of these apostates, okay? And he does that in the way of introducing us, if we don't know yet, four groups of people uh, that are pe people and angels, I should say, and then three individuals as examples. And in, in uh, Numbers chapter 14, he talks about the children of Israel in the wilderness. So if you haven't read that, you want to read that this week, Numbers chapter 14. And we went over that la last week. And then in Genesis chapter 6, he takes us there to give us a review of fallen angels, what they did, where they're at now, what they're going to be doing in the future. And we covered that. And then in Genesis chapter 19, he took us there to compare these apostates with the people from Sodom and Gomorrah, which I learned for the first time that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, as bad as they were, they knew the truth at one time. They rejected it and then gave way to the sin and, and the indulging of, of their flesh, homosexuality and all of that stuff. Then today, he's going to take us to Deuteronomy chapter 13 and to Jeremiah, if we have time to get through all of that, because he's going to talk to us about the dreamers, dreamers, and dreamers are false prophets, but he also says that they're perverted sexually, so we're going to get into that and see what that means, and then probably next week, we're going to get into the three individuals that Jude mentions, and he compares them with these apostates. Why is he making all these crazy comparisons? Why do I need to know this? Because you and I, have the capacity to become apostates ourselves. Oh, absolutely. Listen, we are all just human beings. Well, me and Bobby Mikado were talking this week about us being under rowers. There's only one captain of the ship. The rest of us are in the belly of the ship where it stinks of sweat and perspiration. And there are people rowing and nobody knows who they are. But they're important. Because they're taking the ship in the direction that the captain said it should go. That's really all we are. We're all the same. We're all the same. So we all have the capacity to become apostates. And that's why you talk to people. Very good friend of mine. I won't mention his name. But his father-in-law got saved and was very active during the Jesus movement. And today, that man, he's very smart. He denies Christ completely. I cannot believe this guy. What in the world happened to you? Well, that can happen to any of us. So we want to keep that in mind because that's why Jude is telling us what he's telling us. And next week, we're going to talk about this guy named Cain from the book of Genesis. Some say he was the first murderer. We're going to talk about a strange prophet by the name of Balaam. And then we're going to talk about Korah who led a rebellion against Moses. And you know what's interesting? We're going to talk about it more next week. But Jude gives them to us in this order, but they're not really in this order. So why does he do that? Oh, man, we're going to unlock so many deep things next week. But go to verse 5 now. Verse 5 in Jude chapter 1. 
But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude assumes two things here. Number one, that we need to be reminded of that event. Uh, and number two, that um, he assumes we're already somewhat uh, familiar. And so to me, uh, that has always been uh, interesting that God would want uh, to remind people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the Old Testament in the tabernacle and in the temple and in the New Testament in the church. Isn't it interesting how God always wants us in church? on a regular basis, doing communion, getting taught the word. You know, in the Old Testament, every Sabbath, if a Jewish person was near the temple, he had to go to the temple with his whole family. And on every Jewish holiday, everybody had to show up to the temple. Everybody. Especially the men, because they're supposed to be the leaders of the home. And if they don't know the Bible, how in the world is the rest of the family going to know the Bible, right? And so in the New Testament, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, and Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that they were to show up regularly every, sat, every uh, Sunday uh, to church. And then there's so many scriptures, of course, about the pastors teaching the word for, uh, and not only teaching the word, oh, Okay, I just went, that's back. Not only teaching the word, uh, but uh, constantly studying the word with our families at home. Why? Why does God want us to do this on a regular basis? Answer, because he knows how quickly we forget. Old Testament and New Testament, God's people seem to be some of the most forgetful. And then, of course, Jude assumes that we already know our Bibles if the apostles could see the church today, I think that they would be shocked at how many Christians don't know their Bibles. And more than that, how many Christians aren't even interested? You know, I had a pastor tell me one time, you know, Mario, you should not do so much teaching of the Bible. You should figure out a strategy. You should get a topic and you should go that way because people are bored of the Bible. And, you know, I'm afraid to admit that he's right. Not the first part. I'm going to teach the Bible. But the second part, people are bored and they're tired of the Bible. And you know what? I'll tell you right now. You guys are on this Bible study because you love the Lord. And I know that because you have an interest in Jude's letter. If you didn't, there's no love for the Lord. And most people have no interest at all in going deep and studying what Jude is writing because they don't love the Lord. They really, they're not interested. Maybe they have a God of their own understanding, but they're certainly not interested in this God. Instead, you know, if you invite them to church, there, there would be many of them, maybe most of them, would be happy to go to the church if they're going to get entertained, if there's going to be the light show and the concert and dancing and be, make me feel very emotional, and then I'll go to church. Or <clears throat> if there's a charismatic speaker, Oh, yeah. Excite me. Tell me things. Tickle my ears. Make me feel emotional again, you know. And you know what? If you have to, if you must blend a little bit of the Bible with that, okay. I'll take, but as long as it's a little bit, okay, don't go get carried away with what the Bible says. Or if you're going to blend it with philosophies or the self help philosophy or new age or life coaching, if you're going to mix it with all of that, then I'm interested in going. And you know what? I'll even give you some money. Oh, yeah. This is the mindset of so many Christians uh, today. But you know what? Jesus doesn't preach that. You don't find that in the gospel. You don't find that type of ministry in the book of Acts or in the epistles. That's not what you find. So the church overall, not all, but the church overall today looks like the church of Laodicea. What is that? Study the last eight verses of Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is giving you a description of what the church is going to look like right before he comes. And the church looks like that today. 
It's neither hot or cold. It's lukewarm. But they say we're powerful. We're wealthy. Look at all the seats that are filled in the church. My goodness, don't you wish your church looked like this? Well, I do. I do if the church were more like the church of Philadelphia. Jesus says of the church of Philadelphia that that church is the apple of his eye, so to speak, because they have uh, held on to his word and they have not shunned to offer his name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, this whole attitude of united we can. I saw there was this big church function uh, last week. 5,000 women were there the way I understand it. And they're waving the flags and dancing up and down. I know the, the denomination. They're very emotional, very Pentecostal. But then on the big stage, on the big television screen behind, they had a big sign that said, United We Can. Wow. Think about that with the lens, through the lenses of Scripture. Think about that for a moment. United We Can. And you will recall in Genesis chapter 11, that's what Nimrod said to the people before they built the Tower of Babel. Let's come together because united we can do it. Is that a biblical philosophy? Oh, no. But it's a great counterfeit, isn't it? All the world philosophy preaches that one. No, we can do nothing apart from Jesus. I don't care how many our number is. There's just no way. That's what the Bible teaches us. So look at verse six. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, we talked about that last week, they left their own abode. He has reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So all of these illustrations, Jude is offering to, the, to, to us as an example of how these people got that way and how we can guard ourselves from getting that way, to getting to the point of apostates, right? And let's pick it up in verse eight. Likewise, also these dreamers, they defile the flesh. They reject authority and they speak evil of dignitaries. And this gets into some heavy scripture now. Here goes verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, we'll get to him next week, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. Balaam was the first televangelist, always out there begging for money, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. All right, so let's start with the dreamers. Who are these dreamers? Well, you have to sometimes, it's not that we want to become these great Greek, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bible, uh, you know, scholars. But sometimes you have to go to the original language, good morning, Nick, in order to know what these writers are talking about. And when you go to the original language, this word dreamer is, and I'm going to try to pronounce it the best I can. Inupnia zomai, inupnia zomai, meaning filthy dreamer, speaking of sexual images and immoral conduct. Think about that. Filthy dreamers, sensual images, leading to immoral conduct. Does that not sound to you like pornography? Absolutely. Absolutely. You say, well, Mario, Jude wrote this letter almost 2,000 years ago. Yes, and pornography was alive and well and just as powerful then as it is today. If you go with us to Israel, we will go into shops where they have these archaeological findings and maybe we'll even visit some archaeological digs. 
And one of the things <clears throat> that you will see are these little statues of naked men and naked women, some women with multiple breasts. And I don't want to get graphic, but it is clearly pornography. And they're found in Israel, which means that the children of God, even then, were practicing pornography and all of this immoral conduct, physical conduct that goes along with it. And so when you're reading and you ask yourself, as I asked myself many times, why in the world are the children of Israel always engaged in idolatry? The Asherah poles and the, the, uh, the um, ah, man, Baal and all of these gods. Why are they so interested? And they're always returning to this thing, baking cakes to Tammuz. Why are they doing all of this? What kind of satisfaction are they getting? Sexual satisfaction. Pleasing the flesh. Children are born out of that. Unwanted children. And so they were also, good morning, Renee. I'm so glad you're with us. My friend Renee from Santa Barbara is on with us on Facebook. The reason they were doing this is for sensual pleasure. Because along with this idolatry, worshiping these statues, praying to them, were the practices of illicit sex. And out of that, Babies, unwanted babies, of course, were born, but no problem there. They would just abort them the way we abort them now. That's right. And if you're an American, you now have a president that is actually promoting this. Uh, they weren't as sophisticated then as they are now. They would put them on the hands of Molech. And in Molech's stomach, they had a fire burning, so the hands were sizzling red hot, and they would place the babies there, and they would drown the cry of the babies with the drum beats. That's what they would do, because these babies just got in the way, because that's what religion does. And that's why God would go in and judge them so frequently, because they were engaging in these kinds of things. And so that's what he's talking about right here when he talks about these dreamers in the book of Jude. If you've never read your Bible, read the book of Jude. You can start there and you can join us as we go through the, the Bible. Uh, so according to Jude, it's not only, though, about sexual gratification. This whole thing about pornography and um, sexual sin that we talked about last week in Sodom, when we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude says that it defiles the flesh. Wow, what do you mean by that? Again, we have to go to the original language. And what Jude is saying is that it stains, it pollutes, it contaminates the flesh, meaning what? It leaves its mark. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you talk to anybody who's been involved in pornography or just somebody who's been involved in a lot of fornication, that is sex with multiple partners, if they're going to be honest, they will tell you that those graphic images have left a mark on their brains and they will never forget. Good morning, Jan. Good morning, Christine. They will never forget the images. You say, well, but then they get saved and then the Lord forgives them and then they get married and then the images are still there, which is why so many marriages have problems, which is why so many men get older and they get tired of their wives and say, you know, my wife, she's nice, she's cool, but she doesn't look the way she looked when she was 25 or 26 or 27 or whatever it was. And now, hey, we're in our 50s, we're in our 60s, we're in our 70s, and there's this cute girl down at the car wash, and when I take my convertible Corvette down there to get polished, she smiles at me. And the other day, she told me she really likes me. So now, I'm going to leave my wife, because with all these images in my mind, my wife no longer compares to my idea of the perfect woman. And we got all kinds of problems. And you know something? I'm going to tell you. Years ago, I would have left it right there. But today, the women are doing it too. Oh, yeah. How many 50 and 60-year-old women do we find having a relationship with guys in their 20s or their 30s? Oh, man. There's a lot of them today. Why? 
because exactly what Jude is describing here. And you say, wow, man, I'm glad I'm saved. Hey, look around. It's happening in the church too. It's happening in the church too. It's unbelievable what's going on. But it's all because people are ignorant of what the word of God is telling us. And then Jude goes on and says one more thing about these dreamers. He says that they speak evil of dignitaries and make reviling, that is condemning accusations. All right. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. But in other words, pornography, this is what I want you to understand. This is what Jude wants us to understand. It's not just a sexual act. It is coupled with rebellion and disrespect for the authority of God and the authority that he has put in place. If you don't know what I mean there, read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. He'll tell you all about it. There are no powers <clears throat> set in place that God did not put there. I don't care how corrupt they are. God put them there either to punish us or to bless us. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we have our leaders. God allowed for them to be there. So you can read that and know more about that. We'll talk about that in a minute because Michael, the archangel, is a good example of the, these issues that we're talking about right here, reviling and condemning. Look what it says in verse 9. We're going to get into some heavy, heavy doctrine in Scripture now. Yet, Jude says, Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, a condemning accusation, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. So, in verse 6, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, Jude told us about these fallen angels. He told us about their history, their future, uh, their purpose. And then we looked at Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. And we got all of that. That gives us all of that information. Um, and, and then the future of the devil, who is a very powerful, not more powerful than God, but the devil, Satan, once called Lucifer, the angel of light, is a very powerful angel in rebellion of God. And so Michael, the archangel, or the chief angel, that's really what it means, is a powerful angel that has remained faithful to God. Well, the Bible describes different angels, and I don't know if the angels are just limited to this or not, but they're different kinds of angels. So in Isaiah chapter uh, 6, verses 1 through 7, you can read it later. But you see these angels and they're seraphim, all right? And they have six wings. And it says with two, they cover their eyes because God is so holy. With two, they cover their feet because God is so holy. And with two, they fly around the throne of God. And day and night, they cry out, holy, holy holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And every time they do, the pillars, and I don't know how they have pillars in heaven, but the pillars at that temple in heaven, they begin to shake. The whole place just quakes. Why holy, holy, holy? Addressing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Day and night. These are the seraphim. Powerful angels but then there are cherubim and maybe more powerful than the seraphim and you can read about them in ezekiel chapter 1 verses 5 through 18 and by the way what we're talking about here is is angelology so if somebody asks you today you were in a bible study what did you talk about if you really want to impress them that we covered the subject of angelology they should be impressed all right write that down <laughs> Listen, above all these other angels, there are archangels. And I don't know that there are too many of them, but I know of two. If you're familiar with the Apocrypha, part of the Catholic Bible, not part of the Christian Bible, there's another one named Raphael. So there's Michael, there is Gabriel, and according to the Apocrypha, Raphael. And there may be more, but you can read about them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. One of them will blow the trumpet at the, to make the sound right before the rapture. 
And so there's all of these angels that are sent by God to minister to us. That's their purpose. And then, of course, there are demonic angels to defeat us. And I can tell you that when the Bible talks about these powerful angels, it's not talking about, ooh, powerful angels. They go to the gym and they eat rats and they do cardio. It's, no, no, no. When the Bible speaks of powerful angels, it is talking mostly about their power to deceive and seduce people. That's what they did in Genesis chapter 6. We talked about that last week. And the other thing about these angels is, and their power, it is on many levels and in many different ways. One thing you find out from Daniel chapter 10 is that they're territorial and they control governments. And you can read it later, but in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is praying for 21 days. Nothing happens. That's three sevens. Nothing happens. And then on the 24th day, the angel Gabriel appears. He's another archangel, and his ministry seems to be delivering messages. And he tells Daniel something interesting. He says, Daniel, I want you to know that you are greatly loved in heaven, he says. Also, I want to tell you that the moment you opened your mouth to begin praying, your prayer was heard. Well, then why didn't you get here then? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Because as I was making my way to you, the prince of Persia stood in my way. And the archangel Michael had to be summoned to battle with him and open the way for me to come here with you. Oh, yeah. These fallen angels, these powerful angels. Remember last from last week, demons are spirit. Angels are angels. They hold territories and they hold governments. And I can tell you that there is one that is very prominent in Washington, D.C. this very day. When we have a president like the one that we have now, saying those things, making those decisions, putting those unbiblical uh, ideas into law, let me tell you, we need to pray for our nation. I don't say that, oh, well, Mario is a pastor. He has to say that. Look around. Look around. We must pray for our nation. And some of you guys that are on with us are from Sweden and from uh, England. You got to pray for your country too, the leadership there. And so the other angels we see are guardian angels. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 13 to 17, Elisha and his assistant, they're about to be visited by soldiers sent from Syria because every time Syria makes a plan, God tells Elisha what the plan is. God, uh, Elisha tells the, uh, the, mil the Israeli military and they defeat them every time. And so the king of Syria finds out about it. He sends these soldiers to Elisha's door. And Elisha tells his servant, hey, open up the door. It's those soldiers. And they open up the door, and the ser servant looks back, and Elisha says, oh, my, we're done, Elisha. We're done. Look. Come and look at what I saw out there. There are so many of them with swords and spears. They're on horseback. And what are we going to do? And Elisha falls to his knees, and he says, Lord, show my servant what is really going on. And he tells the servant, go open the door again and look past them. Look on top of the hills. And he does. And he says, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The soldiers are at our door. But the angels have them surrounded on top of the mountain. They were all guardian angels. He couldn't see that until Elisha prayed for him to see that. See, we have to see things through biblical lenses. So there are guardian angels as well. Those same guardian angels in Daniel chapter 6 are the ones who protected Daniel when they threw him into the lion's den. You can read that. But then there are messengers. And the number one messenger is Gabriel. He's the one in Luke chapter 2 that told Mary that she was uh, pregnant. And she was pregnant with the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And I told you in Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel delivered a message to Daniel. Daniel had a dream, and, and, uh, and Gabriel came to interpret the dream for him. So where you find these guardian angels, they're protecting. 
Where you find Gabriel in the Bible, he's delivering a message. But where you find Michael, Michael is battling. All right. We already talked about that, Daniel chapter 10. But how about the future? Michael's ministry is not done yet because in Revelation chapter 12, he is battling Satan and one third of the angels that decided to follow Satan and he wins. He casts them out of heaven, but he only wins because of God's help. Okay? No angel is more powerful than the God that created them. So don't ever let anybody mislead you with that. So in the Bible, Jan, you can read a lot about angels. I'm talking to my friend Jan because he read the Bible one time and I want to encourage him to keep reading the Bible over and over again. My buddy from Denmark. But in the Bible, you can read a lot about angels. But in verse 9, Jude is talking about something you and I have never read about before in the entire Bible because we don't find it in the Bible. He says that when Moses died and was buried, that the archangel Michael and the devil were disputing or literally fighting over Moses' body. How crazy is that? And why would you do that? Moses is dead, man. Why are you fighting over the body of Moses? And listen, it's not a couple of little demons and a couple of seraphim uh, angels. We're talking about angels of the highest office. Okay, Satan was a very powerful and beautiful angel before Michael cast him out of heaven with God's permission. And Michael is the archangel assigned to battle. He is the warrior for God, all right? They're fighting over Moses' uh, body. And so um, in Numbers, and you know, why don't you turn there? Go to the front of your Bible, to the book of Numbers. It's... Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, okay, and Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to read 18 verses to try to get a handle on this thing, all right, Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through uh, 20, <clears throat> and I'm going to start reading. And this tells us the history of the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. And it tells us why Moses died, never entering the promised land. Very important if we're going to understand why Michael and Satan are fighting over his body. He says, there was no water for the people to drink at that place. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses and said, if only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers, a sarcastic remark. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die, Moses, along with all our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here to this terrible place, this land that has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates, and no drink of water? You guys that are new to the faith, you're still celebrating. You made the altar call last week. Hooray, hallelujah, I'm saved. It's all good now. Keep walking with the Lord. You're going to experience challenges, and that's when you want to remember this stuff, right? Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said to Moses, and listen, these are specific instructions. Just like the Bible gives us specific instructions. We are not to add to them. We talked about it last week. We're not to take away from them. Specific instructions. He says in verse 8, Numbers chapter 20, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community as the people watch. Speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. And here we go, verse 9. Moses did as he was told, kind of. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. And he said, are you ready? Listen, you rebels! Exclamation mark. He shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and he struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. 
But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me, underline that, enough to demonstrate my anger, no, my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. Aaron, you're going to die in the wilderness. Moses, you're going to live till the final day before they enter the promised land, but you will not enter. Understand, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness by himself as a shepherd, wanting to free the people to get them into the promised land. He invested another 40 years leading them through the wilderness, 80 years, and now he's told, Moses, what you did was so bad, you're not going to enter the promised land. And Moses didn't take that easily. He didn't take it lightly. He begged. He begged as you and I would. I invested 80 years. I put up with these people. I put up doing the things that you told me to do that I didn't want to do. And then there was war. And all these, and I'm not going to enter the promised land. How can that be, Lord? How can that be? I'll tell you why before we tell you how it can be. First of all, was God angry? No, God was not angry. The people complained. But that time, that specific time, God wasn't angry. Did God say to strike the rock? No. He told Moses to speak to the rock. Well, Mario, isn't this trivial? Come on. Follow along with me. Moses misrepresented God. And he is human. He might have done this before in the past, but he misrepresented God this time, this way. And this was big. You say, well, Mario, why was it so big? Why is God making such a big deal about such small details? Oh, my God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. When you're reading through your Bible, and you read that in the Old Testament, and you make your way to the New Testament, and you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. It was not a trivial thing. God gave a specific set of instructions to do things his way with his words. And Moses, the man of God, didn't do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. You mean like the book of Numbers, Paul? Yes, like the book of Numbers. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on the dry ground, in the cloud and in the sea, and all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and here we go, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. Moses, it was so important that you did exactly what God told you to do, the way he told you to do it, because there were things bigger than you that were going on, Moses, and you didn't know that, but you should have trusted. You should have trusted the word more than you trusted yourself, and you didn't, Moses. And I've got to teach you a lesson. And we got to go public with the lesson because I don't want Jack 3,500 years ago to do the same thing that you did. I don't want Matthew 3,500 years from now to do the same thing that you did, Moses, or Mario, or anybody who calls himself a pastor, a leader, or anybody in the congregation. When I say to do something the way I say to do it, it must be done that way. You do not get to do ministry the way you want to do ministry. And Moses, I've got to make this point very clear. Otherwise, things are going to be very messy. And so Moses focused on his present experience and his circumstances and his emotions so much that he disregarded the word of God and he lost sight of the big picture. God had a master plan in mind. All right. So God wanted to be represented. In that incident, in that event, to the whole world, past, present, and future. Why? To tell you and I, when you're thirsty, the water's there for you. Just ask for it. 
But don't think that I, God, am angry with you because you're thirsty and you're asking for a drink. Huh? But Moses misrepresented. So now, if God had not cleared that up, we could be confused by that. God wants to satisfy our thirst in every way, right? Now, Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 7. Turn left from the book of Numbers. Because here is recorded uh, Moses' funeral. And it was the loneliest funeral in world history. It was just Moses and God. Until later, the archangel Michael and the devil showed up. So Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 7. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo. And if you are going with us to Israel, Jack said, don't go. Forget Jack. I'm going to mute him. He can't. <laughs> no, I'm mean, just kidding. Jack's been with us there twice. Jack's been there three times, actually. But when you go to, oh, four times. All right. When you go to the Dead Sea, I will show you way across the Dead Sea and all the way to the other side of the plain, which is really Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? You go with us to Israel, you are going to have a year or more worth of Bible study. It's going to blow your mind. But when you look over the Dead Sea, we go to that little beach right there, and people rub dirt on them, the mud, and they swim in the salt water and all of that stuff. But you look to the other side of that, and then across that long plain, and there is a mountain way over there. You could barely see the shape of it. That mountain is Mount Nebo, and that's where this took place. And it's not in Israel, it's in Jordan, but you're along the, the border there when you're at the Dead Sea. So, oh, Roberta's on, on, on Facebook, and she says, I floated on the Dead Sea, and she's right. I witnessed that. We all floated on the Dead Sea because you can't go under the water there. But he tells Moses, or it says that Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo on the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him, Jericho is right by the Dead Sea. We go to Jericho after the Dead Sea. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. So God took Moses up on top of Mount Nebo, Nebo and he showed him all of the promised land. All of Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho. The city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, Moses, but you will not cross over. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of God. And he, uppercase H, <clears throat> uh, uppercase H, uppercase G, you guys are in a 12-step fellowship. Notice and tell your friends, ask them, how come in the 12 steps, the word God has an uppercase G in front of it? Why is that? Is it so you can have a God of your own understanding? I don't think so. I've been studying the Bible on Saturday mornings and I don't think so, right? So it says, and he, that is God, buried him, Moses, in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Nobody knows where. Moses was 120 years old when he died, and look at this. He wasn't sickly, okay? His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. Moses went up on that mountain to meet God, to see the promised land, and drop dead. And it was a beautiful thing because he was going to be in the presence of the Lord. So he wasn't saying, oh, okay, I made it. I got up to the mountain. Now I can feel it. It's coming. No, he's perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy, right? So God assigns many things for his people to do, Old Testament and New Testament. God has prophets. He has all of these servants. He has kings. He has priests in the New Testament. He has disciples. He has apostles. And he has us. And we are assigned to do all kinds of things. But every once in a while, there are things that are so important to God that he says, step aside. I'm doing this myself. Remember after Noah completed the ark and the rain started to come down and now all the animals were in the ark? Who closed the door to the ark? Did God assign somebody to do it? No, God did it. And right here, who did God assign to bury Moses? Taking an animal here at is a team decision. I just went and checked out. Tina, you have to mute yourself. Oh, there you go. 
Um, no, God did it himself. And he did it in a place where nobody knows to this very day. Why? Why did he do that? Well, I'll tell you. Or let me ask one more question before I tell you. Why is Michael the archangel and, 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 and Satan the cherub? Why are they fighting the two most powerful angels, it appears, in all of God's creation? Why are they fighting for Moses' body? Why well, think for two reasons. Number one, if you look at the history of the uh, Israelites, they always had this tendency to make idols for themselves. In fact, again, uh, Alex and Desiree, if you guys are coming with us to Israel, I'm going to take you to the upper room in Jerusalem where they met and the Holy Spirit came down. That's the upper room. Below the upper room is the lower room and there is this big, beautiful casket there and it's draped over and there's candles. They make it look real religious. Tina, you got to mute yourself. There you go. And, it, and they make it look real religious. And you know what they'll tell you? That David is in that casket, King David. Well, David is not in that casket. But it's what religious people do. And I'm just going to say this in passing. 12-step programs have become the religion for so many people these days. And it was never intended. God certainly did not give it to us for that reason. And recently, <clears throat> along with religion, there's always relics. And recently, I've noticed people who spend a lot of money buying these very fancy basic texts and other books that are numbered, and they're in leather, and they got the silver pages, and they got red market, and they're so, how would you say, they're so special that they leave them in the plastic, and they show people. And I wonder, I just wonder. Does that also go in line with the religious experience? Maybe for some people it does. For some people, I know it doesn't. Okay. But when I look at religion throughout history, religious people are always idling something other than God. The Catholics are notorious for that. God never liked that. God never wanted it. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you any amount of money you want that if the Jews had known where Moses' body was, they would have gone to worship at the gravesite at best. At worst, they would have dug him up, put him in some kind of thing, and they would be worshiping him to this very day. And Moses was not God, and that's the problem with that. Second reason, um, I believe that, um, well, let me, let me go to... Uh, Revelation chapter 11. Go to the back of your Bible now. Revelation chapter 11. Because I believe that Moses' ministry, as effective as it was, it ain't over. It ain't over yet. <laughs> Moses' work is not done. Let me tell you why I believe this. Okay, Very important. Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 to 12. And we're running out of time, so I'm just going to start reading now. Uh, God says... I will give power to my two witnesses. We're talking about the uh, uh, seven years of tribulation, okay? I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. What is that? Two and a half years. I'm sorry, three and a half years. Two and a half years, I'm sorry. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, listen to this. This is future now, okay? Fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These two witnesses have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls. In the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. These two witnesses, they have power, okay? The two men. <clears throat> when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we talked about those angels and that beast last week, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. What? The angels from the bottomless pit, this beast... They're going to kill these two prophets? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But then look what happens because Satan never wins. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, that is Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. 
Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their bodies to be put into graves. So they're going to be laying in the streets of Jerusalem dead. And those who dwell on the earth <clears throat> will rejoice over them. They're going to have a party. We killed the two prophets. Those people that were talking about the word of God that just annoyed the heck out of us. We killed them. Oh, yeah. We shut them up. Right? And now we're going to celebrate. We're going to make merry. And we're going to give gifts to one another. Hey, everybody. It's like Christmas. We just killed these two prophets of God. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. How did they torment them? By simply giving the word of God. You will be surprised how angry you will make some people if you tell them what the Bible says. Um, now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. Whoa, they've been resurrected from the dead. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And who saw them? Everybody. Because CNN and Fox News are there. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. You think they're going to be freaked out? Oh, my goodness. Like words cannot describe. So when I read Mark chapter 9 and Jesus has a meeting at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And by the way, another thing I learned, if you go with us to Israel, we're going to go to Philippi which is all the way to the north at the foothill of Mount Hermon. And we're going to talk about some very heavy things that took place there, including the conversation that Jesus had with Peter when he says, who do they say I am? Right there on that spot, they had that conversation. We know that for a fact. But then the tour guide will say, this is Mount Hermon. This is also where the transformation of Jesus, transfiguration of Jesus took place. I don't think so. After studying this, I don't think so. I think that meeting took place on Mount Nebo where Moses was buried. I, that's what I think after studying this. But um, who showed up at that meeting? It was Elijah, who never died, if you know the story. And it was Moses. And then when I read 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has full control over the rain. And he calls fire down from heaven. And when I read the book of Exodus, Moses turned water to blood and Moses pronounced plagues on Egypt. Why do I say that? Because I believe these two prophets in the book of Revelation future are Elijah, who represents the prophets, and Moses, hey, Mario, good to see you, and Moses representing the law. In other words, their ministry ain't done yet. So in closing, I just want to say, <clears throat> understand that Christianity is not a club. It's not a game. Understand that when you give your life to the Lord, you and I and all the people before us have a responsibility. It's a heavyweight responsibility to do things the way the word of God says, ministry, family, recovery, everything the way God says specifically in his word because there is so much that is going on around us that is invisible there's a lot going on that is visible but it's only because of what is invisible these angels have dominions they have territories they have purposes and there's fallen angels and there's faithful angels and the picture is big, it's vast, because the plan of God is big, it's vast, but it is also very precise. So we cannot be like Moses, doing things nilly-willy like they say, because I'm experiencing an emotion, because I've got lots of people following me now. Oh, I got to do this special, because my ministry is to recovering people. You better be careful. There's only one Bible. Oh, there's a recovery Bible, but that's just because of the footnotes. That's just because of the translation. It's actually a Bible. There's only one Bible. And the Bible gives us specific instructions to carry out the will of God with the specific gifts that he gave us in the specific way he asked us to do it. That's why when Paul wrote the letter to the church of Ephesus, he wasn't playing. 
It wasn't a joke. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against or rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation. And here we go. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Because without that, you got nothing and i'm amazed at how many christians know this scripture so well they repeat it they talk about it but they never talk about the power of angels that are behind this paul's motivation for writing this to us is because there are powers that exist in the invisible realm if god was to open our eyes to see them we would drop dead of a heart attack every one of us they are more real than we are we're only going to live 70, 80 years. These guys have been around thousands of years. They were present when God created the heavens and the earth. So we're just going to do our relationship with God the way we think best? I hope not. I hope not. And that's why my prayer is that every church will put aside all of their topics, all the money they're spending on the worship team, all the stuff that they're doing and say, you know what, today and from this day forward, we are going to teach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. By the way, that's what the priests did in the Old Testament, those were, who were faithful to God. That's what the rabbis did. They didn't preach all these fancy sermons. They didn't have, you know, their focus wasn't on this ministry and that ministry and over there. It was the word of God because they understood the things that we're talking about now in the letter of Jude. They understood it full well. And they understand it today. You go find a synagogue. And the majority of them open up. They don't have the New Testament. But they open up the Tanakh. And they open up the Pentateuch. And they do deep studies there. Because they understand the value of teaching the people. Not about themselves. Not about what they think best or like best. But teaching the people the word of God. They understand the value. It's an eternal value. And so I want to encourage you guys to remember what Jude has to say and to not repeat the same mistakes that our adopted ancestors made in the Old Testament. They're very costly mistakes. Remember, last week and this week, many didn't make it to the promised land. They died in the wilderness. And the New Testament tells us they serve as an example of, to us what to do and what not to do so if you're doing christianity your way if you have no desire to study the bible for yourself and for your family for the benefit of your family please pray that god will give you a hunger and reconsider and make it the center of your life father we thank you for your word father we pray for every single person who doesn't know your word and who calls themselves a christian May they understand, Lord, that may be a big reason why they're backslidden, why they can never seem to be consistent in their relationship with Jesus, in their church attendance, and in the study of, of your word. And Father, that you would remind us here and so many others that if there's no place else, they can come here on Saturday and we will be faithful to teach the Bible chapter by chapter, book by book, verse by verse, giving every listener, Father, every listener, your words, not our own, not our own. Ours are irrelevant. Our ideas, our motivations, our, our systems, our strategies, they are nothing, nor are our ministries. There's only one thing that is eternal, that it has eternal value, and that is your word where we find your son. So Father, we ask you these things. And again, we ask you in regards to George and South Sea that you would touch their bodies and heal them. And Lord, if there's anybody listening now on Facebook or on Zoom or later on, they'll be in the, um, on the YouTube channel listening in. Lord, 
if they're struggling with health issues, if they can't stay clean and sober, Father, that you would get a hold of their lives, that you would open their eyes and cause them to know what it is to give themselves fully to you. Then they'll know. Then they'll grow. Then they'll find the freedom they've been looking for. Thank you so much for your scriptures, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to end our uh, Facebook. See you guys next week. And we're going to open it up for questions and comments. I know I went a little over, but that's just something that we have to do in the book of Jude. Because if we're not familiar with what he's referring to, we can't really understand his letter. And his letter is very rich with warning and with teaching. So thank you guys for listening. I don't see any hands up, which is fine. Today, uh, actually not today. Uh, let's see, today's Saturday. I think Thursday was Lahana, my daughter-in-law's birthday. And so we're going to go uh, to, I think, Newport Beach later this afternoon to celebrate her birthday. And we had to, she's on with us. We had to rent a U-Haul truck because of all the gifts that we bought her for her birthday. And we got to drive that thing down there. <laughs> <laughs> our love for lahana is our gift i'm just kidding well all right so let's see any hands any questions any comments anybody we got a little bit of time for some short ones okay well if not then i'm going to go ahead and ask uh pastor jack to pray us out and i say pastor jack because he is that he really is and uh, so is Matthew. And a lot of you guys that uh, got, look, that's my, you see my grandson right there in Lahana? Everybody says he looks like me, but our color of our skin is total. I don't know who that guy sitting next to her is. Uh, but the he's color better of our looking skin. than you. <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe that. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's our oldest son. And that, that's Mario Jr. And that's uh, little, little Mario. We call him Rio. And that's Lahana. And by the way, South Sea, the lady we prayed for, is Lahana's grandmother. So keep her in prayer. And with that, Jack, why don't you lead us out in prayer? Can you keep me in prayer as well, Mario, with my housing situation? With your what situation? My housing situation. Yes, absolutely. Thank I have you. you on my prayer list. Thank you. Okay, Jack, take it away. All right. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you for what Mario brings uh, to us through the scriptures. Um, thank you for all this information. Sometimes it becomes overwhelming. Um, and, uh, can't say enough about being able to dig into the word and see uh, why you put it there. Uh, and, and how you could shape us to be able to utilize words that were written thousands of years ago. Um, you say that your, that your yoke is easy, and sometimes it doesn't seem like it. Uh, I know in my heart that it is, but sometimes it just doesn't seem like it. And um, we thank you. We thank you for the warnings you provide us, the examples you provide us, uh, the love, grace, and mercy, especially that you provide us and the constant um, reminder that of ourselves we can do nothing without you we are lost lost and lost so thank you so much lord uh, for this opportunity to be reminded of how important it is to follow you obey you and read your word in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And please invite somebody. Please uh, invite somebody. You have a copy of the flyer. You can forward it to somebody. And, uh, and invite them to there's come a, with us next Saturday and every Saturday from this point forward. There was and a new lesson here that I'd like to say. Don't, don't, 
Don't forget uh, Israel. Okay, consider Israel in February. We have, I think, 18 or 20 seats left open. And I can tell you that um, there are churches, I won't mention them by name, some of them I know very well, and they're doing the same trip for $4,500 and more. Ours is only $3,150, and that includes the flight. So don't be discouraged. Don't let your flesh discourage you or the news or what people say. Come with us. Israel will blow your mind. You'll never read your Bible the same again. All right? And if you, oh, you know, I have an issue, money or whatever, my job, whatever it is, pray and the Lord will make a way. I could tell you lots of stories about that. God bless you guys. See you next week. Invite a friend. I love you.